Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me today, whether you're joining for the YouTube premiere live or you are joining at another time um, at your convenience. I really appreciate your time. If we have not had the chance to meet already, my name is Amelia Manning and I am the Career and College Admissions Specialist at Maine West High School. Now, tonight's presentation is going to be a bit more focused in on the college application process, given that it requires some several steps for our seniors that should be taken starting now um, and will continue to accelerate as the school year gets started. This is an extended version of the presentation that was shared by the counselors during senior orientation last Monday, and it adds a bit more depth into the college application process um, so that both students and their parents and guardians have the opportunity um, to benefit from this information. If you have questions, since we aren't in a truly live format, at any point in this presentation, please feel free to use the link that was provided in the email that was shared with you, and also that is included in the description below this video to submit your questions. I will follow up with you individually, so please feel free to share any questions that you may have. I'm happy to help. So with that said, um, as you prepare for 2021 and for life after Maine West, the first step in the process for you is going to be making that decision about which type of education or training is needed in order for you to meet your career goals. And I like to emphasize this, I know we're focusing in on college applications tonight, but this is a really good chance to take a step back and evaluate whether that college education is the step that's needed to be taken right after high school. There are many options out there after high school that aren't necessarily college, so it's important to evaluate what that return on investment looks like, which ones would help you meet your future career goals, and feel free to contact me or Kayla Hansen in the CCRC if you would like some assistance with helping to evaluate this. But if you're a student who knows that college is going to be the best path for you in order to meet those career goals, now is a great time to be searching for colleges, or maybe you have already, and then starting to dig deeper into those colleges as well. So you can search for colleges, and it's not too late if you're just starting out, using some resources like Naviance and Big Future, which you have access to as students at Maine West High School. And then when I say dig deeper, I mean research those schools a bit further. Good resources to use are the websites of the colleges themselves, both learning about the college as well as reading up about the specific program or programs that you are interested in. Looking at the official social media, media accounts of the colleges that you're interested in because they tend to publish a lot of information on those accounts but also looking at unofficial social media. And by that, I mean looking at what current students have to say about their school without the shiny image that the university may be helping them put forward. And then also by attending different virtual events that colleges are offering right now. I think it's important to remember that we are very fortunate that college campuses have opened up many more opportunities to our students than they have in the past. It is a lot easier now for students to access virtual student panels, really get a sense of what, what other students are saying about their schools, even to sit in on a class virtually, which would be great to do on a typical campus tour, but can often be hard to fit in. So these additional avenues are being put forward and can be a great asset to you as can those unofficial social media accounts where you can really start to assess that student voice in a bit more of an authentic way. So I encourage you to seek those out after you've started coming up with that list of schools so that you can really get that insider's look. When we talked about visiting college campuses in the past, that's what we hoped you would get out of that campus visit. And like I said, you have many opportunities if not more, at your fingertips to be able to do that now. So 
it has to go through this research. I cannot emphasize this enough. It's important to really reflect on the fit of each school that you are looking at. And when I say fit, just a refresher for you, we're talking about fit in, in three different dimensions. The first is academic. So does the school have the major or the program that is best suited to your career goals? How do you also compare to other students who are admitted to the school or to the program? Is it what we call a likely school, match school, or a reach school for you? Which I will explain more in one second here. With that academic fit, it's important not just so that you feel successful, but so that you also feel challenged enough to continue growing as you advance through college and, and then move into your future career. So very important to consider academic fit. And then when we look at social fit, I don't just mean, you know, the other students that are on the campus and whether or not you would enjoy them, uh, but what is the student body at the college really like? What do they like to do? What are they passionate about? How big of a school is it? Is it in a rural kind of campus town setting, a suburban setting, an urban setting? How far is it for you from home? That's very important for many of our students. What is that diversity like on campus? Are you kind of fitting in with the students there or are you representing and which one do you prefer or are you comfortable with? And of course, do they offer opportunities on campus for you to really explore your interests? There are other interests that you're really passionate about. And then financial fit, which I cannot stress enough. What is the cost of attendance of the school? Would the amount that you have to take out in student loans be greater than or less than how much money you would make in your first year working after college? So, these are all factors to take into consideration. And what you will notice is that you're pulling in a lot of different data points. So I recommend keeping some sort of a document or a spreadsheet to include all of those factors. And if you would like any assistance with this, please do not hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to help you put that together and also to talk through some of what you see in your research. Depending on how many schools you actually meet your criteria, I recommend then prioritizing your list down to about five to eight schools. This is a pretty general recommendation, um, but it's there because each application is a significant time investment and applications can cost anywhere from $50 to $90 on the higher end. So it's important to really talk about all of these components with your family because this is a family decision. You are potentially spending four years, if not more of your life in this decision. Um, so please make sure that you're looking at all of those different criteria and talking with your families on a continual basis. You can also absolutely reach out to me or your counselor if you would like help thinking about how to prioritize that list too. And when I talk about prioritizing the list, usually it's a good idea to strike some kind of a balance across the list. So I typically think of this in, in, in a few different ways. The first is, do you have a balance of the likely schools, the match schools, and the reach schools that I mentioned before? So if it's a likely school, that means that your GPA is a bit higher than the average GPA of the school or maybe the specific program that you're applying to. Um, normally, this also includes test scores, but many students don't have test scores this year. So GPA will be a good piece of information for you to look at when you're trying to assess this. Then we have the match schools, and those are schools where your GPA is kind of right in the middle of any published ranges, or it's right in that average that the college is publishing. And then finally, you have the reach schools, where your GPA is maybe a bit lower than the number that they publish, or the acceptance rate is fairly low for that school. So making sure that you cover all of those bases will really make sure that you have a number of acceptances coming your way, but also that you have options to choose from second semester. On that balance list, another factor to consider is also a mix of both public and private schools. This does not have to be distributed equally, um, but it really plays into the next component to consider, which is your cost of attendance. So again, this idea 
of having a financial safety on your list that your family can afford, um, schools where you have good chances of receiving scholarships, very much a family decision. So it's very important to have those conversations. So moving forward to the applications themselves, which if you've started already, that is fantastic. If not, it's a great time to start doing so now and it will probably consume a lot of your time between September and October. When I refer to applications, they include several different components and each one can be a little bit different, but this is what we see pretty commonly across the board. First, there is the application itself, which is biographical information that colleges will use to learn more about you. Sometimes they'll ask you questions that help them assess whether you're eligible for certain scholarships. For instance, if you are a first generation college student, if they're asking you what level of education your parents receive, they might have a first generation student scholarship that you may be eligible for. Those applications can be found in a few different places. So there is the Common App, which uses really one form that students can complete to submit to multiple colleges at the same time. Of course, there are some nuances and colleges have their own additions, but it helps streamline the applications to those schools. The Coalition app functions in a very similar way to the Common app. So if you see the Coalition app, just think of it as another version of the Common app. And then finally, the institutional application which means when I say institutional, it means a specific college or university. So a good example of this would be the University of Illinois. They have their My Illini app. So University of Illinois, their application is available on the Coalition app and through their institutional application. If you're not applying to other schools on the Coalition application, then you may just want to fill out that My Illini application to save yourself a little bit of time. So Important things to keep in mind that you may find applications in different places um, and they're all available online for you. So very easy to access. And if you need help finding any of this information, please do not hesitate to reach out. Other common components of those applications would be things like your activities and honors. What were you involved with in high school? Or what were you doing outside of classes in high school? Were you taking care of family members? Were you working? There are areas to talk about this throughout your application. Then of course, there's the essay or the personal statement. There's a section for supplemental information or additional information. There's your letter or letters of recommendation that go into scholarships. Your official transcript will be something that you need to order at some point in time through a service that we use called Parchment. And then your test scores. You may need official test scores or unofficial test scores may be okay. Of course, not many students this year have test scores, so that requirement has changed, but it may be something that you see. And then for your application to be considered complete, there may also be an application fee or a fee waiver that you are required to submit. And finally, you may be required to submit your FAFSA, or a CSS profile or the alternative application for Illinois financial aid. So before we get into the details of these different application components, I wanna give you a view of kind of the overall timing of this, what, what you're really working towards at this point in time. Some of the more common types of deadlines that you will see out there are early action, early decision, and rolling admission. Now, with early action and early decision, students apply earlier in the year. Usually the deadlines that we see are things like November 1, November 15th, sometimes December 1 or, or sometime in, in mid-December. But when you apply under one of these plans, you are telling colleges that you are very interested in attending school there. Now, usually it also means that you find out your decision earlier than students who apply under the regular decision deadline. So that's, that's an extra benefit of applying early under those, those two different types of deadlines. We highly recommend that you have applications in for one of the earlier deadlines because this may help you in the future, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second here. 
but it's very important for you to know the difference between early action and early decision. Early action, you can apply to as many schools as, as you'd like at that point in time. Um, but with early decision, it is considered to be a binding agreement. So that means that you are telling the college or university that if you get in there, you will go to school there. You will accept their offer of admission. And because of this agreement, that really means that you can only apply to one school as an early decision school. So it's very important to make sure that you're reading through these policies in detail. You can always find more information on the college websites, but please feel free to talk with your counselor or with me to help weigh the pros and cons of whether this decision is good for you. It is great for some students. For others, it is not a good idea. So definitely something to take seriously. And then finally, with rolling admission. Rolling admission means basically that colleges are reviewing your applications as they receive them in, in a little bit of a shorter time frame compared to applying by one deadline and finding out on one date. You get those decisions as they review them. And usually there is kind of some end deadline in sight, but I still recommend that you apply to these types of schools a bit earlier in the process because they often have some priority consideration to keep in mind. And because they're releasing these decisions, it means that they're also filling spots as they get applications. So if you apply earlier, you're more likely to get a spot. So from an organization standpoint, it's important to know these deadlines, of course, because your application has to be submitted by that deadline. But it's also important to know them so that you can kind of plan backwards when it comes to the components that require help from other people or other services. So your letters of recommendation, your transcripts, your official transcripts, if you need official test scores, if you need an application fee waiver, all of these things involve outside parties or services. So it's best to assume that deadline applies to all of the materials that need to go with your application. And then make sure that you're giving yourself maybe two weeks of buffer to make sure that it, it has gotten there in time. The other thing I will say is that for your personal records and, and your personal time management, it's a good idea to submit your applications, I would say at least three days before the deadline. The reason I say three days is because you may find yourself running into Wi-Fi that's down, a website that's crashing. We've all had our fair share of technology issues. So allow yourself a little bit of that extra cushion to submit your application. And then if something goes wrong, you have a little bit of time to figure out a backup plan so that it still gets there on time. This would be true in any year, but especially this year when so much work is being done online. So why apply early? There are many different benefits, but a few especially that I would highlight to you. The first one is full scholarship consideration, which I alluded to a little bit earlier. Many times colleges will say that they have a priority scholarship consideration deadline. If you miss that deadline, you miss out on those larger scholarships that the colleges have to offer. So applying earlier helps ensure that you meet those deadlines. And you can always find those deadlines on a college's website if you're not sure. The next is selective program requirements. So if you are looking at a program like nursing, business, computer science, Depending on the school, certain programs may be more selective than others, but the earlier deadline in those instances may be required for direct admission to that program period. So make sure you're reading very carefully, not only the college's deadlines, but also your specific program that you're interested in. And applying early will also give you adequate time to then shift your focus to a more dedicated external scholarship search. From a time management standpoint, it can be very difficult to complete all your applications and schoolwork and outside of school activities and responsibilities 
while also filling out scholarship applications. So getting those applications in on the early side, give yourself a little bit of a, a window to relax, um, and then really intensify those scholarship searches and applications, especially as we start looking into second semester. So looking at components of the college applications themselves, I'm starting with testing here, not because it is the most important piece of a college application. Um, there are many other factors that go into your application, as you know, uh, that are just as, if not more important than testing. But it's very important for the class of 2021 because you've had a very unique situation and a lot of questions have come up. And the good news is that close to 1,500 colleges and universities in the U.S. have de-emphasized the use of standardized test scores in the admissions process. So that's close to half of the colleges and universities in the United States. And more announcements about going test optional or de-emphasizing testing be, seem to be coming in almost every day. So this number is likely to grow. The website that is cited here, fairtest.org, is a great resource for you to check these schools to see who has taken that step forward. But there are two terms that you may see as it relates to testing and college admissions. The first is test optional. And a few things that you should know about test optional schools. One is that generally when a school says they are test optional, their focus is on admissions. It doesn't necessarily apply to scholarships, though our hope is always that it will as well. It's a really good idea to confirm with the admissions office about their scholarships and whether or not they will require test scores for scholarships, but not for admission. The other thing that you should know about test optional schools is that if you send the schools a test score, they will look at them. So it doesn't mean that they've decided to ignore it completely in all instances. Part of this is important is because Part of why this is important is because that your test scores can be printed on your transcript. And we do this to help save you money when it comes to sending the score reports. That is another cost that can add up very quickly with college applications. So make sure that if you do have a test score and you want it printed on your transcript, um, that, that you have the right test score there. Uh, and if you have concerns about this, please talk with your counselor to make sure that your transcript is, is portraying what you would like. Now, if you don't submit test scores, which I know is a very common question, what's good to know is that that means that there is more emphasis placed on everything else in your application. So the classes you took and the level of rigor the grades that you got in those classes, your essay, your activities, your letters of rec, all of those are being focused on even more so than with a test score. Test score, really just another piece of data. So that covers test optional schools. Another common term you may see, and there are many of them, but another one is test blind. This means that even if you send in your test scores, colleges will not look at them. They will not use them for scholarships, but this means that they're not looking at those test scores whatsoever. So right now, you're probably wondering, should I try to take an SAT or an ACT and kind of cram one in? What you should know is that there is an SAT planned in school for October 14th. That is the plan right now to have it offered in school with safety measures in place of course, depending on where we are at that point in time, plans may change. And this is a makeup exam from the exam in April that you would have taken as a junior. Now, technically speaking, this is a graduation requirement from the Illinois State Board of Education. So that means that unless the Illinois State Board of Education decides to waive that graduation requirement, you will have an opportunity to take it in school at some point this year, whether that be on October 14th or whether that be in April. Now, 
April is a little bit late for college application deadlines. So you still have the option to register for a national SAT or ACT. If you're looking at applying to colleges with one of those early deadlines, you would likely need to have this completed by about mid-October in order to have the scores in time. So before you rush out and register for an outside SAT or ACT, these are some questions that I recommend considering. First of all is, do the colleges on your list require an exam for admission? It's really important to know this because that is the reason why you would take the exam in the first place. A secondary question would be whether they require it for scholarships, but then I would be asking, have you been preparing for the exam? And do you feel like if this is your only opportunity to take that test, that you're really going to test well? Because the next question to be asking is, are you comfortable with going to a testing facility, especially with students you may not know? And are you comfortable with testing in a mask for that period of time? Be prepared that if you do find one of these testing dates outside of school, that testing sites may cancel even up until the last minute. Um, many testing centers are filled. So just be ready for that uh, if, if that's the route that you choose to take. But I cannot stress this enough. There is a reason why so many colleges and universities have adopted test optional policies this year, if not um, looked at more, in, in, more enhanced uh, test optional type of policies. The fact that there's been a little bit of a scarcity of seats in testing centers have, has started to put this disproportionate emphasis on getting a test score, or even just getting a spot um, to be able to take a test. And the truth is that all the other components of your application have just as much weight, if not in some cases more, than those standardized test scores. So please think about this carefully. And if you would like to talk it through, I'm happy to help you with that as well. So back to those application requirements, let's move on to letters of recommendation. In most cases, students are asked to submit at the most about two letters of recommendation. But it's really important to know that not all colleges require this. So please check first. Um, it's, it's important to be respectful of your recommender's time. And I'm sure you would rather not reach out to teachers, counselors, asking for letters of recommendation, and then realizing that you don't need them and, and feeling a little bit embarrassed at the end of the day. So just keep in mind that we ask that all of these requests for recommendations be submitted at least 10 school days, so days we are physically in school, at least two weeks in advance, if not more. Um, if not more is especially important to emphasize because the more time that you give to your recommender, the more respect that you're showing them, and also the more time that they have to write you a really sound letter of recommendation. Compare it to writing essays for a class or doing homework. If you're working on multiple at once and trying to cram them in right at the last minute, it's a little bit harder to have a, that quality level of work. So give your recommenders as much time as you can. And to also help you get a better letter of recommendation, be sure to share a letter of recommendation request form with your counselor or with your teacher. Those are available in the CCRC Google Classroom that was shared with, that was shared with seniors on their orientation day, uh, but also on the CCRC website. So on to application essays, which are really your opportunity to demonstrate who you are as a person and what makes you different from other applicants. It's an opportunity for you really to highlight information that can't be found anywhere else in your application as well. Um, maybe it's not something that shows up anywhere. Maybe it's something that really warrants a lot more depth. But for the class of 2021 especially, I think it's important to remember that while COVID-19 has been a very significant moment in your lives, as it has been in all of ours, uh, there will be opportunity to address COVID-19 
somewhere else in your application. Of course, there are exceptions in different scenarios where it, it may be very germane to that application essay. However, there's a reason why colleges have moved that into its own separate section now for you to be able to answer that question. You really want to make sure that you're you're showing them who you are and presenting as a unique individual. Of course, I suggest that you proofread with maybe two trusted adults, teachers, counselors, or myself. Um, always happy to help you. And I also want to highlight that essays aren't the only writing um, that you may have in your application and not the only place where you may be able to let your own voice shine through. Some examples of this would be in the supplemental information or additional information sections of an application, which are really useful if you feel that you need to give some context to what, what your reviewers might see in the rest of your application or information that's really not available anywhere else. So some examples would be if your grades dipped due to an illness, prolonged period of time outside of school, um, or if, if due to that prolonged period of time outside of school, you weren't able to participate in extracurriculars. To sum it up, it's, it's extenuating circumstances that have really affected your high school experience in a number of different ways. Like I said before, while COVID-19 might sound like it fits in the supplemental information or additional information section, this year colleges have added on a separate section to their applications specifically for COVID-19 impacts. So be sure to look for that and, and sort your information accordingly. So moving on to the money part, let's talk a little bit about finances in college. Um, first, you, you will encounter a number of different fees in the college application process. If you are able to get test scores, then you would be looking at fees for the exams, you'd be looking at fees for score reports, if official score reports are in fact required. Now, you should also be aware that, as I mentioned before, most colleges will require an application fee as well. And that is required in order for it to be considered complete and officially submitted. Because it ranges from $50 to $90 and you're potentially applying to five to eight schools, that can really add up. So keep that five to eight range in mind. There's a reason why it's there in addition to the level of effort required from applications. If your student receives free or reduced lunch, please keep in mind that fee waivers are available for those students. Um, this applies if a student receives free or reduced lunch, public assistance, or if your family is facing some other sort of significant financial hardship. Um, just let me know and I'm happy to help you access those fee waivers and get the instructions to apply them. Now looking at financial aid, this will be something that is coming up uh, very soon in the college application process for our families. Students will need to complete either the FAFSA or the alternative application for Illinois financial aid if they are seeking financial aid. Both of those applications open on October 1st. So Right now, there are no immediate steps that need to be taken outside of having your 2019 taxes filed and having access to all the documents that would go into filing your taxes. The FAFSA is required for students um, who want to be considered for a number of different things. We have our federal and state level grants. We have our federal and student federal student and parent loans. So if you feel that you may not qualify for any financial aid, this is where the student loans piece really makes it very important to fill out this application. And then of course, work study programs as well. It does require that students have a social security number, an alien registration number if applicable, and that information that comes with the 2019 taxes. And the alternative application is, is the same set of questions and same pieces of information that need to be entered, but it's a separate application for qualifying undocumented students and for transgender students who are not eligible for federal aid. In that case, because they were assigned a male gender identity at birth and they cannot 
truly answer the question requiring them to complete the selective service requirement. So filing the FAFSA or the alternative application for Illinois financial aid is a graduation requirement this year in the state of Illinois. A waiver will also be available because we recognize that not all students are either eligible to complete one of these two forms or may not need to complete these forms, um, but it will be something that will need to be completed, whether that be the form itself or the waiver, in order for you to graduate from Maine West. And sometimes colleges may require the CSS profile as well. Filling this out will help you get what's called institutional aid, which means money that's given to you from the college or university directly. So again, no need to take any immediate steps right now outside of those 2019 taxes, uh, but important information for you to be aware of because you'll be getting a deal of communications come October. All right, so throughout this process, as we continue on with the money part, um, you will want to be considering the cost of your post high school options, as well as return on investment. Really, what will you be getting back by making the significant investment in your education that college requires? And these questions are really meant to help kind of guide you through that reflection process. So first and foremost, is college going to be the best post high school option to help you reach your career goals? Like I said before, it is not in every single case. The second question is whether your college list includes financial safety schools. Now, how can I assess what is a financial safety school? There are a few different ways I would approach this. The first is to complete a net price calculator. Colleges are required to have the net price calculator on their websites by law. Not all of them are as, as good as each other, um, but this helps you get an estimate of what that total cost of attendance would be. The next is to use a FAFSA forecaster, and this helps you estimate your expected family contribution or how much money the college expects your family to pay along with other bills that you're paying towards that, that college education. And the last one is to look at institutional scholarships and grants. What is your likelihood of getting some of those scholarships and grants? What criteria are they looking for? This might help you get a better picture of how much that cost of attendance will be for you. The next question to be asking yourself consistently is whether you have maximized your opportunities to apply for financial aid. So by that, have you started looking at outside scholarships and are you applying to outside scholarships? Have you filed your FAFSA or your alternative app by October 31st? It's a date that's good to keep in mind around Halloween because the money that's available to students, we call it free money, um, the grants and even specific programs that you may be eligible for, those do have deadlines, the grants actually do run out of money. So you wanna make sure that your name is on that list earlier rather than later in the year. The next question to ask yourself is how do current and future costs, so your student loans, compare across the options that you are looking at? Now, this question will come into play a bit more during second semester as you start to compare options. So, You'll be getting a lot of financial aid offers second semester that will give you the information to really do this in a very concrete way, but you could start plugging in numbers to a college cost comparison tool that I've included the URL to below. I use this tool a lot with students. I think it's very valuable for you to really get into the numbers and to assess that cost. And the last question here for you to consider is around your projected first year salary. So will the first year that you are working outside of college, will the amount of money that you make be greater than or less than your total student loans for each option that you are considering? We can help you with this in the CCRC by looking at projected salaries and projected job openings, but generally speaking, it's a good rule of thumb to have your total student loans be less than that first year's salary. 
So what comes next? I know this is a lot of information. So here are some of those actionable next steps that you can be taking right now. The first step is to meet with your school counselor. So keep an eye out on your email. Make sure that you follow through with those appointments because all counselors meet with their seniors at the beginning of the year to talk with them about their plans after high school. These are really valuable meetings. The next is to finalize your list of schools. Remember that five to eight number um, and assessing that fit and the return on investment along the way. From there, starting your applications, making sure that they are complete for November 1st. And with those applications, make sure that you are requesting letters of recommendation if they are needed, writing your essay or your personal statement, any supplemental information that you wish to include, ordering your official transcript as it's required by colleges. Same thing goes for official test scores if you have them and if they're required. And then also attending virtual college events. Remember getting those extra pieces of information but sometimes those events can help you answer application questions as well. And attending virtual college representative visits. These are a great opportunity for you not only to learn more about schools, but also to ask questions if you want to continue researching the school and even ask questions as it relates to your application. Um, so keep an eye out for those that will be starting after Labor Day. And then this year, just in general, keep up your grades. Colleges, this year especially, may be request requesting a seventh semester transcript from you. And seventh semester is the first semester of your senior year. So you'll wanna make sure your grades are really strong in case that's requested, but also if you're applying for scholarships second semester and they are factoring in your grades. Coming down the road, as I mentioned before, you'll want to be filing the FAFSA or the alternative app beginning on October 1st and hopefully by Halloween. And then second semester is when you'll really begin intensifying that scholarship search. So that's the road ahead. And this is a number of different steps for you. Great news is that there is a lot of support available to you as well. So the first here is open student hours. I host these office hours on Mondays from third to sixth period, of course, on Mondays that are school days, and then on Wednesdays from 7.30 p.m. till 8.30 p.m. This is a virtual drop-in session, so if you have quick questions or questions that you are comfortable asking in front of other students, please feel free to drop in. Um, even if you want to say hello and hear what questions other people have, it's, it's a good resource as well. The next that you see here is virtual appointments. Using my Calendly link here, uh, it's very easy for you to find a time that works for you. This also syncs with my calendar, um, so we don't have to exchange emails back and forth. But if you have any difficulty finding a time slot, of course, feel free to contact me. And if, if you skip the link and send me an email instead, we will, of course, find a time as well. The counselor's Calendly links, they use the same system, are also available if you look in the Where Do I Go For infographic on the Main West website. So then from there, uh, I will also be offering virtual student workshops, some of which are starting this week. Um, so on Wednesday and Thursday, I'll be offering a workshop on how to find your fit. So if you're a student, who hasn't started researching colleges yet or is feeling a little bit behind in the research, please join me for that. I would love to have you. That will be from 9 a.m. till 9.45 a.m., 1.30 till 2.15 p.m. on Wednesday, and then on Thursday from 1.30 till 2.15. Come during your free block. Um, these are meant to be included in those typical free block times. The next workshop I'll be offering is next Wednesday. It's a Common App FAQ session from 7 till 8 p.m. that will be in place of my office hours that evening, but just to help walk you through the Common App and some of the very common questions that come up with that. And then after that, I'll be having workshops about college application essays as well, sharing some general guidance um, and also sharing some brainstorming activities that might help you with the process. 
from there, those virtual college rep visits that I mentioned as being a great resource for you for information, questions, um, more specifics about a school, they will be beginning after Labor Day. We are hosting these as a district. So it will be you with students potentially from Maine East and Maine South with the college representative and either me, Mrs. Moreth, or Mr. Weber at Maine East um, facilitating that visit. And Mrs. Moreth is at Maine South. This list gets updated very frequently as colleges start booking their times with us. So please see the calendar, calendar that I've included the link to below, uh, the bit.ly Maine West CCRC Cal. It's also on the CCRC website if you, if you scroll down. And then from there, when it comes to financial aid, we are continuing our partnership with the Illinois Student Assistance Commission. Monica Messini is our school specific representative and she was a great asset to our families last year. She will be hosting virtual office hours on Thursdays between 3 and 4 p.m. So after your classes have finished. Um, but she also takes virtual appointments at all times and she will be joining us for some different financial aid application completion workshops an opportunity for you after you've started the FAFSA or the alternative app to come in and, and get some assistance with that. Our plans right now are to have those on October 22nd during the school day, but also after school hours between four and seven, um, and also on November 14th from 10 a.m. until noon for assistance with those applications. I will keep you updated on those plans and the format of those sessions as well. So please stay in touch. Um, many of you have probably already received the monthly newsletter from me from last year. That will continue this year, but I will be ceasing the weekly updates about college rep visits. Those will be posted to our Google Classroom. As I said before, they're also on our website. The classroom is for students only, so please email me for a join code if you would like access to that. And then our website, the URL is listed here on this slide. Students are also going to be getting personalized notifications based on their interest in career ready. Um, this is a tool that Ms. Hansen and I use so that when one of your top three colleges or top three career interests has an opportunity coming up, um, you get notified of it rather than getting a lot of emails about everything that's happening. I also have included my information on social media here for your reference. Um, my Instagram and Twitter handle is Maine underscore Manning. And on Facebook, we also have a page for the Maine West CCRC. These resources are here because we often share just general tips with students, um, but then especially as scholarship season starts to peak, a scholarship of the day, We've heard from students that this is really helpful, um, another way for them to get that information that's not just another email that's sitting in their inbox. So please feel free to contact me at any point if you have questions through this process. You can see my email address here, as well as my office phone and then my remote phone if you're unable to reach me on that office phone. And as I mentioned before, you're more than welcome to schedule appointments using my Calendly link. Thank you very much for your time. Um, really appreciate it, as I said before, and it's my pleasure and honor to help you throughout this process. So good luck to you, and I hope to be able to see you in person at some point this year. Take care.